Okay, well, the discussion of injection techniques is probably one of my most favorite in this book. I think she does a really good job of talking about how contrast is um, to be used, and this is really probably the more satisfying things about the job. Uh, I mentioned that, like in, in x-ray, I think the satisfaction of taking a good x-ray is when you have the person perfectly positioned for that lateral and everything lines up just right. Um, in therapy, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of satisfaction to be said, like you've, you've treated the patient throughout the course, you treated them very, very accurately, there's no discrepancies in the chart, and you're seeing them a year later for their follow-up and they're cancer-free, right? That's very deeply satisfying. Um, I imagine there's similar elements that you find deeply satisfying about nuclear medicine. I don't have as much experience with that. Um, but for CT in particular, I think a lot of the satisfaction comes from how you understand the way that blood flows through the body and you understand these windows of opportunity to get appropriate enhancement for the pictures you're trying to get. So um, before we do any kind of injection, we're going to be thinking uh, how is the access point um, and using a septic technique to look at that access point. Um, we'll be imagining what kind of examination are we doing. So we've already started to think, you know, you know, right lower quadrant, does this person need contrast? Yes, it sounds like they do. There's elevated white blood cell count. I've already kind of done that, and I'm thinking, okay, I need to do a routine CT abdomen pelvis for this patient. I need 100 milliliters of IV contrast and however much oral contrast, and I'm good to go. Um, and then, so the specific clinical indications are largely informing that, right? The problem is, I have some scenarios for y'all today, and it talks about a triple A CTA. In that case, it's like a triple A, it'll say CTA abdomen, triple A. What that's talking about is an abdominal aortic aneurysm, right? Um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, the way orders come off the printer, it'll just say CT abdomen. It won't say triple A. So if I do that protocol, that specific contrast protocol, and I'm looking for a triple A, when, and I did a routine study, I'm probably not going to be able to appreciate that, that abdominal aortic aneurysm to the full extent I need. Um, so there's specific clinical indications. We're constantly kind of puzzling that out. <clears throat> So, well, as I just kind of suggested, these parameters for injection are going to vary. Um, and we have most places that I've, I've been at, really the only place where you do hand bolus stuff is in the presence of perhaps a access point that's questionable or if you're doing pediatric imaging. Every now and then at the pediatric hospital, they'll do hand injections. Most of what we do is mechanical injections. Um, we're going to be messing with the contrast volume, flow rate, um, and a delay. A delay meaning we're going to wait a specific amount of time before we initiate the scan. Because if I just started the scan at the same moment that I started the contrast, I'm not going to see anything. I'm, I'm waiting a little breathless period of time, generally anywhere from about 20 to 60 seconds, depending on what phase of contrast I want to see, before I initiate the scanning. Right, but it's a pretty narrow window. So once the tech is locked in and ready to do that, ready to do the protocol, they may be pretty focused on what they're doing. So as students, if we're out in the clinical site, we're working alongside CT techs. Just be aware, if they've initiated a contrast injection, they may be very focused on the computer at that point, very focused on the patient. And then sometimes we use saline flushes. Both We, we typically use a lot of saline before because we're going to test the patency of the line. Um, but then we might even use saline afterwards to do kind of a bolus peak, right? And they, sometimes they call it bolusing, where you, in addition, you, can't, you don't want to inject any more contrast, but it's almost as though I can enhance the, the contrast by slightly diluting it with an additional bolus of saline, right? Okay, so we're going to look for stable IV access, um, and 
We like those uh, standard indwelling peripheral catheters. That's what we we uh, um, we can use those. Um, and then these central venous access kinds of things like pick lines. Um, she mentioned in the book most pick lines now. Like back in the day, we used to work. We used to worry about doing injections on pick lines. So we would either hand inject or drop the mechanical injection really low, like a, a low flow flow rate for those. Um, but most of what people have in terms of pick lines and um, central venous catheters are um, are like power ports and power picks. If it says power port or power pick or it has purple or if it's a if it's a port access on a cancer patient but it feels like triangular, um, then you know you're good to inject on that, right? Um, a lot of times the patients, if, especially if it's like a power port and the patient is a cancer patient, they may even have a card with them saying it's a power port, you're okay to inject on it. If we need to start a peripheral IV, um, we're going to do that after we get patient consent. So we're going to get informed consent. We're going to make sure we're doing the right exam, the right protocol before I start sticking needles in anyone, right? Um, so sometimes they'll start to like stagger patients out. Like they'll have someone drinking while they're scanning someone else, and they'll have an IV station outside the CT department where they're starting IVs. Just be aware, you don't need to run up to people and start sticking needles with, on, in them until we're sure that we're doing the right CT scan for the right reason. Um, but largely, the very first thing that you can do is assemble all your supplies. Because um, the worst thing that can happen, it's just like changing a diaper. If you go to change a diaper and you don't have the wipes, it's like a storm occurs shortly after that. Same thing for starting IVs. If you start an IV and you're like, oh crap, where's the hep lock or where's, you know, whatever, and you're trying to hold the patient's vein to keep them from bleeding all over the place and you're scrambling to reach something, um, that doesn't look really good to the patient. Um, so use, uh, it's one of those things where the, the best thing you can do is be very methodical at the beginning, right? Lay everything out. Follow a little recipe. I always do things this way. I get the patient history. I get my supplies, talk to the patient. Maybe while I'm getting the history, I've warmed up their arm. Like you can use a warm blanket or we used to have these rice bags that we'd throw in the microwave and microwave the rice bag, put it on the patient's arm because the warmer I can get that access site, um, the closer the, 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 the veins are going to enlarge and they're going to draw a little bit closer to the skin. So you can reduce patient's pain and discomfort that way. Um, yeah, place the needle and then secure the site with, uh, with Tegaderm a lot of times, or maybe with tape. So if we're using some kind of indwelling thing, um, we need to make sure that it's an appropriate site and be thinking about how that site might influence when the contrast hits the aorta or hits the area that we're trying to scan. Um, so, for example, when we use pick lines, especially these power picks or a port, it's that much closer to the heart, right? Um, so it has, a, it has a direct route, so we might see a slight drop in some of our scan initiation times, right? Versus if I'm using an IV that's in someone's hand, right, particularly their right hand, it's going to have further to travel to get to their heart, right? So we prefer the left arm, right, because, again, the veins are closer to the heart, and we prefer as proximal as possible, typically this antecubital area is where we're going to start. Right? If we have to use something on the hand, we know that that's going to, that we may not be able to use hand IVs at all for things like the CT angio studies. Right? Because we will either <coughs> be injecting too hard for those IVs, or we will lose too much of our contrast in it getting to the heart. Okay. Uh, we will flush the IV before we do anything. So we're going to test it. We're going to clean it off, flush the IV. Um, and then sometimes we'll even, if, 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 they have an, if they have medications running through that line, we can still use it. We'll just need to hang a separate, uh, we can connect separately to that line um, and stop that injection, the medication injection, just long enough to do our contrast injection. Be aware that if you do that, some of the lines that, that patients come with for IVs um, 
especially if they're an ambulance patient, may not be capable of holding a power injection. There's been a few times at one place that I worked at where the, if I knew that if they were an ambulance patient, I needed to change out their whole IV setup. Like, so I went ahead and we put a protocol in place that once they got there, they would change the IV tubing out. Because what was happening was we would hook up to the, the ambulance IV tubing, do our power injection, it would blow out the tubing, and there would be contrast and blood all over the floor. Right? So be aware of that. If you're using a peripheral IV, you, you may need to drop your injection rate or just kind of watch it extra close. Um, just turn off that existing medication just long enough and you can restart it. Um, I generally, if I need to do something like that, I will talk to the nurse prior to doing that because there's certain, in, there's certain antibiotics and things that like they cannot be stopped, period, right? Um, and if that's the case, um, we may need to use a different, we, may, we may need to make an, a different access point. Um, and then once we, the injection is completed, we can flush the line with some saline and restart the medication, right? That's within our scope of practice as CT tech. So, um, a central venous access device is a venous catheter designed to deliver medications and fluids directly to the superior vena cava. So there's a bunch of different kinds of these things. Um, and with certain patients, they may be the only option available, especially com folks coming from the ICU um, or from a long-term hospital stay. Um, in the case of using that, again, as I said, we're going, it may affect the, the rate at which contrast is perfusing. Another thing that these things can complicate, they're very, very helpful devices, um, but they are generally made out of a hard plastic. I'll, I'll pass some stuff around that's similar to this stuff. And if I have a bolus tracking ROI, like if I set an ROI on the machine and I want to start an injection when the contrast heats a certain level, but I, that ROI for whatever the patient moves or breathes, and that ROI comes into contact with this central venous access device, it may be white enough on the picture to trigger the exam, right? The plastic might be white enough in the picture to trigger the exam. Um, so just be aware that these things have an impact on the quality of the images. Okay, pick lines. Y'all have probably gone after the pick line nurse has been somewhere, especially the x-ray folks, and had to do a chest x-ray, portable chest x-ray, AP, to evaluate pick line placement. Um, its tip is going to be located in the uh, superior vena cava, right? So as you look at the picture, you'll see it kind of curve in, come into that superior vena cava. Um, and most of the pick lines, especially the power picks and stuff like that that are made, um, they're kind of purple colored, um, they can you can use the mechanical injectors on them. This, this has changed since when I was a tech. Initially, when you, when you started out, we had protocols that the hospital never inject on a PIC, and so, but that, that has changed with the development of new technology for, for the peripherally inserted uh, catheters. Um, we may need to slow down the injection rate, though. Um, and she says that the injection should be done with a hand bolus. I think it's possible this book was written right at that kind of shift time. Because then she starts to talk about um, power picks. These can be used for mechanical injection rates, and they'll actually tell you what their max flow rate is right there on the tubing. You can, it's a little purple tube, and you can look, and it'll say like 3 milliliters per second, right? 5 milliliters per second um, is what it's rated for. Uh, I think most of them go up to 5. Non-tunneled and tunneled uh, central venous access. Whenever possible, avoid using these um, by starting just a, a peripheral IV. Um, we can't use the ones that are used for dialysis, period. They look much different from the ones that are used for like chemo treatment and stuff like that. Um, generally, if we're going to inject even on like a power, um, a power port, um, we will drop our flow rate, right? And if for some reason, I, I've, I've only had one patient where this occurred, but if we're needing to do a CTA study on like a cancer patient, we will need to start a peripheral IV for that study. I'm not going to be able to inject 
the kind of bolus that I need to inject on a, even on a power port. It's just too risky. And the, and the risk is not, I don't know that, that this is ever going to get cleared up anytime soon because the risk is actually that needle access. They use one of those, um, it starts with an H, like a Huber needle or something like that. It's got a crook to it like that. So if you're ever back in the chemo department and you're watching them access ports, they will, you know, they'll numb up the area over the port. Y'all know what I'm talking about, little ports on people's skins. And then they're going to hook that needle into the port, right? And because that needle has a hook, if you can imagine I'm injecting really, really hard into that, then I'm going to make a lot of turbulence there, right? And you could, I, I don't know that this has ever happened, but I imagine one of the, the, the limitations is, is, is it possible there could be enough turbulence to shear off the hook of the needle, right? That'd be a real problem. So we're going to document, document, document anytime we give someone contrast. So the, the sheet that I gave you last week, you can see there's a lot of documentation. We're going to document the type of exam, the time that the contrast was given, the amount of contrast, how the patient handled the contrast. All of that eventually is going to need to be part of their electronic medical records so that if in the future there's another tech doing a CT scan, they said, and the patient says, oh, I don't know, I think I had a problem with that, they can look in the EMR and say, no, you did just fine. At least they didn't document you having any problem. Um, so we're going to document everything that we do. Um, and the other thing is, is that if for some reason, 24 hours out, the patient has some kind of problem and they get admitted to the ER, if the doctors are all scratching their head and saying, I don't know why she's having this reaction, and they don't know she's had a CT scan, that could be a problem, right? Okay. We talk about three general phases of tissue enhancement, and a lot of times the technologists don't use this language. This language is kind of new to me even when I read it. Um, they will normally use the language arterial, venous, and then like a delay, right? Um, so bolus phase means an arterial phase. Non-equilibrium is that venous phase of contrast enhancement. And then one of the interesting things about this equilibrium phase she mentions in the, in the book is it may actually be worse than even having injected contrast. So we have a very narrow window, and outside of that window, um, the contrast may actually be detrimental to the diagnostic value of the study. So when we're using IV contrast, we need to be aware, always kind of conscious of the timing for things, how that timing works. Here's that bolus phase, and here is the uh, ROI. So a region of interest has been placed on the abdominal aorta and then also the hepatic portal vein. And so they're triggering the scan based off of perfusion at those points, right? Um, and you can tell its avidity level. So you can say, I want you to initiate the scan when the Hounsfield units reach 30 plus inside that region of interest, right? Um, so in this, in this, at this point of injection, and for most of like, for the, the heart, for like a PE study, we're probably starting around 15 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds for the, for the abdomen, we're probably talking about like 17 to 25 seconds. We have this little window after injection, depending on the rate of injection and the amount where we're going to see a bolus phase and arterial structures are going to be more readily appreciated. The venous structures won't be filled. So we can see on this image, for instance, the aorta looks very white. Y'all need me to turn on the lights. Right, are we good? The aorta is very, very white, right? The hepatic portal vein is just a little gray. And honestly, it's probably backflow from the inferior vena cava. If they have poor car port of cardiac throughput, they'll actually backflow, like the contrast will backflow out of the um, inferior vena cava into that hepatic portal area. Non-equilibrium phase, the text call this, venous phase. Um, it's going to follow the uh, bolus phase. It begins approximately about 60 seconds, 50 to 60 seconds after the start of the injection. And um, the Hounsfield unit enhancement levels we're going to see is about an increase of about 30, 10 to 30 Hounsfield units for the structures. Um, we may have still have some contrast media in the arteries, but it's also going to be in the veins. Um, so 
So equilibrium. Uh, the one exception to equilibrium phase is doing contrasted brain studies, right? So depending on what sp specific kind of tumor that we're trying to simulate treatment for in that scenario we had earlier, right? If it's a super avid, like arterially um, hungry tumor, um, really metastatic, we may need to do more like a bolus phase injection. We may need to do like a, a CTA of the head, right? But generally, if we're imaging the brain, we're going to start imaging like four minutes after contrast injection, right? So the rest of the body is going to be in equilibrium phase. The brain alone is going to be in an enhanced phase of contrast uptake because of that brain blood barrier, right? Um, so, but generally, once we're talking about after about two minutes out from the start of the injection, the body's going to start to go into this equilibrium phase where the contrast is so diluted now in the circulatory system that there's not an avidity. We can't toss an ROI on a structure and see any increase in Hounsfield units because of the contrast presence. So it does not help in terms of understanding the attenuation of different structures on the images. So, um, which phase would we say this is in our images here? Good. And why, why do we say non-equilibrium? There's not very much. There's a little bit in the aorta, but it's about equivalent to the amount in these hepatic veins, right? And then what's this here? Which side of the patient's body is this on? It's the left side of the patient's body. So what kind of sits in that upper left quadrant of the patient's body. It's the stomach. So that's, that's the rugae or folds of the stomach with um, oral contrast inside the stomach. So this is non-equilibrium phase. So um, the exact timing of the start and time of each of these three phases, there's a bunch of factors that we're going to be have to be playing with. So um, injection parameters, like for that protocol, for that specific protocol, condition of the patient, are they alert, are they anxious, are they, um, are they really, really sick, um, are there other things that are other factors that are going on, like a chest tube, you know, now in addition to everything else I'm thinking about, there's a chest tube sitting there and I need to make sure that it's not going to get knocked over when the scanner moves. Um, so... Uh, and then probably the biggest thing is going to be the patient's cardiac throughput. As I mentioned, if we have a person who's in any kind of uh, heart distress, they may not be able, there may be funny things that happen to the contrast after we inject it. Um, so generally the injection protocols that are set up are almost just like the CT protocols. We're not going to mess with them a whole lot. Like if we're doing a CT of the admin pelvis, we're pretty much going to follow the same injection for every single patient. And the reason for that is those have been tested and tried. They're within the window of when that contrast enhancement is going to occur for most of the population. <coughs> right? Um, if we need to vary it because of any of these factors here like cardiac throughput or any of that kind of stuff, we, we kind of need to be very cautious in the way that we're varying things. Here's some different routes. Um, and this is the route that it's kind of more vis appreciable in our in our body. Um, for some reason, she's she's marked it out um, from the right hand side of the patient, but you can see coming in from that that right side that there's a bigger distance to travel to the heart, right? Um, but it kind of goes through the heart and it's pumped out to the aorta and up through the uh, uh, carotid arteries and down to the iliac arteries and and then it starts to move into the venous system. Here's some arrival times. These are um, 
she provides this table, you know, of course these numbers are going to vary uh, from patient to patient, um, but it makes sense um, according to what we were just looking at that we would expect it to arrive at the right atrium um, and then move from there to the pulmonary arteries, left atrium, then out to the aorta around 15 to 22 seconds after injection, right? So you can see it is significant if we're doing a CTA study, it is significant to know, am I looking for, like the, from the example earlier, if I'm looking to rule out a blood clot in the pulmonary arteries, I'm talking about triggering the exam uh, after about nine seconds after injection. Versus if I'm looking for the abdominal aorta, it may be more like 15 seconds. And the way that, or 20 seconds even, depending on the patient's cardiac throughput. So the, the way that these new scanners are scanning, they're scanning so quickly that you can actually jump your bolus, right? Um, so that's something you have to be careful of is if I initiate the scan too soon, right, I jump my bolus and now I've scanned before it even hit that bolus phase, it's going to be very hard to scramble and try to scan and still get in the bolus window, right? Because while you're reinitiating the protocol, you're going to pass through the bolus phase into that non-equilibrium phase. Does that make sense? You all get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So typically we'll have the ROIs placed or we'll, be, we'll wait for it to perfuse quite a bit with the newer kind of scanning hardware. Then we'll maybe even have a slight delay after that and then initiate the scan so that we don't miss the bolus. Here she mentions the routine for the brain. Um, injection rate's not important. In fact, we can just like hang the contrast and do a drip in contrast. We can drip the contrast and then initiate the scan like two minutes after all the contrast has been has flowed through the IV into the patient. Right? Um, so again, if that patient from, from radiation therapy is here for the simulation of, of a more venous kind of tumor, um, rather than freak the patient out who's wearing the mask and, uh, and doing a really fast bolus phase type injection, I can do a drip, injection, a drip um, contrast administration. They're not going to have the discomfort and the acute adverse effects of the contrast, um, and I'll still be able to visualize what I'm looking for in their brain. So here again is that drip infusion, it's pretty rare. Most of what we do is a rapid injection of contrast media. Hand boluses are largely used for pediatric patients, and in rare instances we might use them on adult patients. Really, really rare incidents like, like, like for example, we're not able to get um, any kind of access other than like maybe access to a vein in the foot. I had one patient came in, they had an IV in the foot, it was literally the only IV this person could tolerate. And um, so we did a hand bolus injection on that. And we really had to mess with our delay times on that because, again, the distance from the foot to the heart is that much more than from the left AC to the heart, right? Uh, but we did a hand injection, and one of the reasons I was, I, I think I mentioned earlier, maybe doing something like a like syringe toothpick race where we we squirt water out of syringes at toothpicks and try to make them race, um, is to get y'all with a feeling for different sizes of um, syringes, right? Like a 10 milliliter syringe feels different from a 60 milliliter syringe. Injecting a, a 60 milliliter syringe, you're really going to have to put some elbow grease into it, right? Very, very hard. Um, especially if I'm already injecting something that's very, very viscous, it has a lot of friction in it already. Um, you will feel the difference, for instance, injecting contrast versus injecting saline, right? Um, so a lot of times, rather than, in, say I, because the thing is, here's the bind. If I'm injecting 100 milliliters of contrast, I could very easily put that in either two 60 milliliter syringes, right? Or how many 20 milliliter syringes would I need for that? 100 milliliters of contrast, five. I would need five 20 milliliter syringes, right? So when you do the math, you think, I would much rather disconnect and reconnect once and do two 60 milliliter syringes. But the problem is just this. If you're doing a hand bolus technique, that 60 milliliter syringe is going to be very, very difficult to push. So get the, the five 20 milliliter syringes, bam, 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 and you're, you're good, right? 
Most of what we do though is mechanical injectors. And some of them, most of them that we see have a single head. Some of them have two, uh, a dual head, especially if we do a lot of CTA cardiac studies. They like to have the dual head. The, the one side is going to be used for contrast. The other side is going to be used for saline. So this is a MedRad um, a syringe used on like the Stellant system. And you can see it's got the, the syringe. If you're using a dual head system, it'll, this packaging will be very similar. Only there will be two. Um, injectors in it and there'll be a little doohickey that connects the two injectors. Um, but y'all feel free to pass this around if you want. Yeah, you can try kind of pushing this down in there. It, well, I may have just totally screwed it up. Um, <laughs> first time I've done that. Um, this part right here hooks up to the top of the syringe and allows you to draw the contrast in, right? Um, then you're going to need to flush all the contrast through this line, right? Um, until a little bit drips out of the, this end here. So sometimes it has an additional little plastic thing that you can put over the end here, or honestly you can just use this piece because you don't want to get contrast all over the floor. So you're going to prime the syringe until a little bit of contrast comes out the end of it, and then it's ready to hook up to the patient. We would not want any air bubbles in this line. And we definitely don't want to fill this up with air and inject that into the patient because the patient will then have a seizure and die. Right? So the way that we, it, there's protocols in every hospital um, for how you indicate that the injector is ready for, for use, right? Most places, if the injector is pointed toward the ceiling, it means do not inject with this injector. It's not been prepped, right? Because the way we're going to prep is we're going to stick this thing on it and draw contrast into it. Once it's pointed down, that generally means it's been primed and the line is clear of air. That's, a lot of times they do that in most CT departments. That's how the techs communicate to each other. This is not ready. This is ready. Right? It is still up to you to make sure that there's no air in that line and that this syringe is not full of air. Even a very small air bubble can cause some serious damage. Air embolism. And she says here, prevent... Contrast media extravasation and air embolism. So, the pharmacokinetic factors are largely the things that we're playing with. The patient and equipment factors typically are outside of our control. So I mentioned that protocols, we have some control over the type of uh, characteristics for the contrast media, so like its level of viscosity, the level of dilution, um, whether or not we're using uh, a saline injection after the contrast, the flow, the amount, the amount of time that the flow occurs over, um, as well as the total scan time. Those are the, the kinds of things that we have some control over. Um, If we want a more pronounced arterial enhancement, we're going to have to increase the flow rate quite a bit. Um, there's a table in our book, I think it's like page one, yeah, 158, and it shows the impact of flow rate on Hounsfield or aortic contrast enhancement. Um, so you can see, if I'm using a 5 milliliter per second flow, I can get aortic enhancement in the range of 300 to 350 Hounsfield units. But if I use a flow rate of 1 milliliter, not only is my enhancement peak going to be later, there's going to be delay, it's never going to rise much above the level of 150 Hounsfield units. So typically, um, if we were looking for that uh, arterial enhancement, we're going to increase the flow rate. Um, the, other, the other factor in here, is, since we're talking about time, is the speed with which the scanner can scan. Okay? So the scenario I've got for you today deals with just that question of the speed with which we're injecting versus the speed with which the scanner can scan. Basically, how not to miss our bolus, how not to jump the bolus, but also how not to 
if I've got a scanner that takes 30 seconds to scan, right, um, am I going to be able to get a true arterial phase of whatever anatomy, right? That's kind of the question, and that's why a lot of people are constantly wanting to update their scanner. It's because they keep hitting that wall. They, they literally can't scan what they're asking them to scan because of uh, the constraints of the technology. So here again are some t different time density curves. And I like these curves because they look very similar to um, the, injection, the injection flow rate curves that actually read off. So when I'm sitting at the CT control panel, typically I have um, two monitors that help me operate the scanner and then a third monitor that is tied directly just to the, the in power injector, right? They're two separate systems. They don't typically work together. They work in separate worlds, right? So I have to prime the injector to select the flow rate at that injector console and initiate the injection there. And then go back to the CT computer and tell it, okay, here's what we're scanning, here's what we're doing, go. So, for a constant volume and concentration of contrast media, if we're not messing with the volume or the concentration, as the flow rate is increased, there's a decrease in the time to the peak enhancement. We saw that. Um, you can see that very clearly on this diagram on page 158. It's kind of there in the last slide, too. We can see the peak gets hit much quicker at, one fit at 5 milliliters per second versus um, 3 or 1 milliliter per second. Um, so we may need to adjust our scan delay accordingly. So increasing the flow rate shortens the duration of the injection. That just makes sense. Like it's just like if, if you're going to chug the Coca-Cola versus sip it slowly over the course of an hour, right? Um, for CT Angio, um, the scan timing must be very, very precise. When we're doing a routine CT abdomen pelvis, chest abdomen pelvis, we have quite a, we have a larger window because we're just working within that non-equilibrium phase. And it's, it's a big window. It's like a minute. Um, with CT angio, I need to know specifically what body part are we trying to see with uh, arterial enhancement. And I need to be thinking at what time is that going to enhance, right? The pulmonary arteries will en enhance first. Then the aorta will enhance, right? Tracking with how the blood flows, then like the carotid arteries would enhance, right? Then finally something like the, the femoral arteries will enhance, the iliac arteries will enhance, right? So depending on what I'm trying to view, um, I'm going to need to change my delay times and things like that. And we can play with the flow rate during the injection, um, so we can kind of like hit a peak. We know that we're going to hit peak right about here. And now I'm going to reduce the flow rate. I'm going to slow down the flow rate and kind of try to drag that peak off. I'm going to make like a little plateau. Um, we do that sometimes with CTAs of the head and neck and stuff like that. So patient factors, as I mentioned, cardiac throughput and weight are the big ones because if we have a very big patient, not only are there table limits, like most CT scanners have a table limit of around 400 to 450 pounds. We can't scan bigger than that. Um, in addition to that, if we're dealing with someone who has a lot of soft tissue or any kind of uh, additional soft tissue that could be attenuating the beam, that all of our contrast may be lost just to that soft tissue. So I've scanned people who are pushing the table limit, and I may have, there was no reason to inject contrast in them. Um, be because all of, basically all of the attenuation was occurring within the soft tissue. The contrast was not adding anything to the enhancement of the images. Um, the big equipment factor is probably going to be the speed with which the thing can acquire imaging, and that's largely tied to the rows. So I was at a clinical site not too long ago, and the, the tech kept on talking about slicers. She's like, well, we got the four slicer over there and the 16 slicer over there. I was like... I've never heard anyone refer to it as that. Um, it sounds like you work in a deli. Um, but what she was talking about is the speed with which these things can scan. Um, 
because the fa that, and that was the big push back in the 1990s was to get faster and faster scanning technology. Um, that's not so much a concern now because once you hit 64 slices, you can scan, you're, you can operate that well within the window of any arterial enhancement. So the, the added benefit of like 128 slice is, it's, you're kind of starting to split hairs a little bit. There are some benefits to, to the new technology, but um, it's not super pronounced. So two methods um, are going to exist for trying to make sure that the bolus is in the arteries before we initiate the scan. I have never, well I take that back, there's only one scan protocol that I've ever worked with that used a test bolus. Um, and what that is, is you do an injection of like 10 to 20 milliliters of contrast and you watch, it does repeated scanning at that area and you see when the enhancement occurred, right? And so you know, now I can set a time gate there and when I start the actual injection, I'm going to wait for that period of time and then I'll initiate the scan, right? Frankly, that just seems like a lot of extra work to me. Most of what people do is bolus triggering. And what that means is, you like that image that we had earlier that showed the ROI placed on the aorta, that was from a bolus triggering scan. So I'll set up the protocol, I'll set up the injector, and then I'm going to determine a level at which I want to gauge perfusion. So I initiate the contrast, it starts its injection, I'm going to wait some window of time, like 15 seconds, and then I'm going to just start doing pulsed scans to that area. It'll go er, 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 like that, and it's just going to scan over and over again to that area. And then when I see the picture that shows me, oh, it just hit the aorta, I will trigger the scan, right? That's most of what people do because it is so nice um, from a text point of view to see there, I'm not going to lose any of my contrast because if I do a test injection, that's 20 milliliters that I can't inject for my bolus, right? I've had to deduct that from my bolus. So I just narrowed my scanning window right there. And, but with the bolus triggering, I can use the full injection of contrast, right? All 120 milliliters or however much contrast I'm using. Um, and I can see actually the perfusion occur and I can trigger there. You can even automatically trigger, like you can tell the ROI when you read 80 Hounsfield units, go, right? And then the, the machine just does it all. So the test bolus again, a, hundred, a 10 to 20 milliliters of contrast, and we're gonna do these trial scans to establish when that enhancement occurred, and then we're gonna add that delay time. Versus bolus triggering, um, we're going to watch the contrast bolus and initiate the scan once it's hit the area that, of interest. Oh, it does mention this drawback, and this is significant. Um, if I do bolus triggering, I will not be able to be there monitoring the patient when I initiate contrast injection, right? Because about 10 seconds after injection, which is not that long of a time, the scanner is going to start doing that and scanning, right? So I cannot be there monitoring the patient during injection. I'm just, I can watch, I can initiate the contrast right there and watch it for just like two seconds and then split. But largely the way I'm monitoring the patient is just on the, uh, from the scanner console. I'm watching that flow detector, right? Any questions about any of that?